Hello, everyone. As you're coming in, I want to welcome you. Just let people file in here really quickly. My name is Marche. I'm the webinar director here at Advice Chaser. Before we introduce our guests and get started, I do need to do a bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own and however true, funny, or interesting are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. We're thrilled to bring you this educational presentation. Attendees are muted, but we encourage you to ask questions using the chat box. The presenters will answer those questions after the webinar presentation today. So don't worry if we haven't got to your question yet, please just put it in the chat box. Uh, additionally, if you can go ahead and leave your phone number as well, if we don't get to your uh, to your question, we will make sure re someone reaches out to you after today's event. We want this experience to be as educational as possible, so please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. I'd like you to introduce you to today's moderator. And Alex, I have muted you, so you'll want to unmute yourself and say hello. Alex Pulaski is president and founder of Basic Concepts Financial Services, LLC. And he has been a licensed professional in the insurance business since 1989. His expertise is in financial planning, both for businesses and for individuals. He's a registered representative of Warner Townsend in Kent. It looks like we have a little bit of uh, background noise there. So uh, a member of FINRA and SIPC. Alex is also a securities licensed in the state of Pennsylvania. And along with financial planning, Alex is a health and life insurance licensed in Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, and Virginia. He also works with small to medium sized companies for medical, dental, vision, voluntary benefits, FSA, HSA, HRA, COBRA, 401k plans, and self-funding medical, dental, and vision benefits. Alex, if you can go ahead and uh, tell everyone hello, and I know I asked you to say a few words. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us today. You know, 30 years ago, I got into this business answering an ad for MetLife and end up being an ad for supposedly management, which turned out to just be life insurance sales. And 30 years later, I find that the amount of education that our clients depend on us is unbelievable. So today we're working with wills, retirement planning, asset protection, clients ask us about taxes. Um, but today's meeting really takes on some special meaning because uh, we're really protecting our loved ones. And, you know, these particular loved ones typically don't have the cap, the capacity to make uh, decisions for themselves. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce a friend of mine and colleague who I've known for 15 years, uh, Robert Corcoran. Um, Bob helps educate people on how to provide lifetime care while maintaining the eligibility to the programs and resources and benefits for those that have uh, special needs eligibility. So without further ado, Bob, I'd like you to take control of everything and educate everybody, everything that you've learned over the past on special needs planning. Very good. Um, thanks uh, for the introduction, uh, Alex, and thanks, Marche, for helping to uh, set this up. Um, as Alex said, um, I'm a CPA and a financial advisor, and I've been working with families with special needs um, individuals since 2004. I'm a member of the Academy of Special Needs Planners, the uh, one of the, the only organization nationally that represents um, 
attorneys, financial advisors, CPAs uh, who deal with the special needs arena. Um, as most of you would know, no one plans to be born with a special needs situation uh, or to acquire a disability at some later date. But when it does happen, you're thrown into this world of complexity, complex medical terminology and complex government rules and an education system uh, that the components of which you may not be familiar with, uh, dealing with IEPs and that kind of thing. Um, and it's difficult. It's difficult enough to raise a child. I've got three adult children of my own and they were a handful uh, growing up and they're a handful now that they're adults. Uh, and you may be working yourselves outside the home. And on top of that, if you're dealing with a special needs situation, it's just another le level of complexity that uh, most people aren't prepared for. So um, we wanna focus on some of the issues that you need, need to be aware of. As Marche said, this is uh, the purpose of this isn't to give you individualized advice, it's to provide you with information, to allow you to be able to ask informed questions and make informed decisions. Um, we're gonna talk about a, a couple of things specifically, um, some legal issues, um, financial issues. Uh, I'm not an attorney, I have a standing agreement with all my legal friends, I won't practice law without a license if they don't practice financial planning or accountancy without a license, and we get along just fine but I can at least give you some ideas about what questions to be asking the attorney if and when you get in front of an attorney. Um, what we wanna do is focus on quality of care. What's the difference between lifetime care and quality of care? When we refer to lifetime care, we're talking about medical benefits and subsistence living, basically, just getting through life, the bare bones basics. There are programs that can provide for that quality of life, quality of care is another matter. Um, we're gonna talk about how you can provide for quality of life for your child, as well as provide for the bare bones necessities. One of the questions I'm asked, and one of the first questions I'm asked uh, by a parent is, uh, look, I, I'm married, uh, I'll take my wife and I, or my, my husband and I will take care of our kids as long as we're both drawing breath. but then what? Who's going to care for my child the way I care for my child when I'm gone? We want to talk about that and what you can do to, um, to ensure that your child is cared for while you're alive and long after if need be. Um, again, we're going to talk about specific areas, legal and financial planning. Again, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, there are some legal terms you need to be familiar with. And I'll at least give you some overview of what those things are, what those tools are, and, and what you should have. Special needs planning is a part of financial planning and part of estate planning, if you will. And it, that's a funny term because people will say to me, well, I'm, I'm not one of the Mellons or the Heinzes or the whatever. I'm not a dot-com zillionaire. Um, I, I don't need an estate plan. Well, if you think of your estate as all of your stuff, whether it's a little or a lot, and your minor children, if you've got either one of those, anything at all of any value, and minor children or children with special needs, then you need an estate plan. It may be basic, but you still need one. And you need to work with folks that understand this stuff, and not everyone does. It's a short list. Um, there, there aren't that many attorneys that deal with special needs planning. There are very few, even fewer financial advisors that deal in that arena. And I can tell you, I'm a member of the Pennsylvania Institute of CPAs. I'm on the executive committee here in the Pittsburgh area. And we're not taught as CPAs, we're not taught this stuff at all. It's just not something that's part of the regular cur curriculum for CPAs. Um, I happened to get involved in it back in 2004, um, almost by a fluke, by being introduced by somebody and uh, it, uh, it's, it struck a chord with me and uh, I'm glad I did, but it's, it's not something that everyone knows. The, the, the statement I make to clients is, it's like asking, if you go to an attorney or financial advisor and ask, you know, can you do this? It's like asking, um, you know, can you swim the English channel? I took swimming lessons at the Y, I could probably do that. No, <laughs> no, you can't. You, you're either trained in this area or you're not find someone who understands this stuff uh, and deal with folks that understand it. 
one key thing, if you walk away from this today with no other information but this, make mental note of this, the $2,000 limit. If you've left assets worth more than $2,000 to your child or other dependent with special needs, you've most likely caused them to lose eligibility for most government benefits. Medicaid and SSI are federal programs, but managed by the states and every state's rules are slightly different. But the general rule is this, if you've left assets, if your child has assets worth more than $2,000, they will not be qualified for those government benefits. And we'll talk about this uh, in a little more detail as we go along, but folks will say to me, well, you know, I work, I have assets, I'm not gonna qualify for any of this. Well, your child as a minor is measured on the parent's assets, but your child at age 18 is an adult and they're measured on their assets. So there is a way for you to ensure that the benefits you want your child to um, have access to are available to them if you orchestrate your affairs the right way with this particular thing in mind, this $2,000 limit. There are two basic government programs that you need to be aware of. SSI, Supplementary Security Income, which is a, an income program. It's meant to pay for food, clothing, shelter, and Medicaid or California Medi-Cal. Medicaid is a federal program of health insurance. It pays the medical bills um, for those that, that have been diagnosed with a disability, uh, who have a mental incapacity, who otherwise meet the standard and financially qualify for it. These two programs often get conf are, are conflated with or confused with SSDI and Social Security. SSDI or Social Security Disability Income is a, is a disability income program based on someone's work record, either the parent or the person themselves. And Social Security is also based on a work record, your parent or the person themselves. Um, they are not income qualified programs. They are not um, um, government welfare programs, whereas SSI and Medicaid are. They're needs-based, so they're different. A couple things to be aware of. Um, again, uh, legal matters, things you should have, a will. And when I say will, I generically lump three things together. When you talk to an attorney about a will, you really wanna be talking about a will, a power of attorney, and a medical directive. Those three things kind of go hand in glove. A will is a piece of paper that says, at my passing, here's who gets my stuff, and here's who I want to take care of my minor child. Most people don't realize that without a will, if you don't have a will in my state and in every other state in the union, the state will give you one. The laws of intestacy kick in and there's a pecking order of who gets what and what percentages. And if you don't, if you've got a special needs child and you want them to not inherit your wealth directly because you want them to be Medicaid qualified, if you don't have a will, they're going to get some of your assets and they're going to be disqualified. So if you've got a, a minor child, I would tell you, you need a will. If you've got a minor child, uh, with a disability or a child of majority with a disability, you definitely want to have a will. Um, and if you have a minor child, you want to be, you want to specify who you would nominate to be the caretaker of your child, because it's going to be up to a judge. People will say, well, my, my brother Fred or my sister Mary will take care of my kids. Well, that might be what you want, but it's not up to you. It's up to a court. The court will generally honor your request if you state it in a will. But if it's not stated, it's up to a judge. Most folks, I don't think, realize that. You want to have a power of attorney because you may not, you may be in an auto accident and not pass away, but you may be incapacitated. Most folks don't realize that if, you know, if you're married, if I'm in an auto accident and I can't speak, my wife can't call my employer and ask for my 401k balance. It's not her money. It's my money. Now, likewise, I can't call and ask for hers. It's not my money, it's her money. And uh, the financial advisor, uh, if Alex is your financial advisor, you, you can't call and say, I want to know my spouse's IRA balance. He can't tell you that. It's not permitted. 
you have privacy rights. Um, so you need to have a power of attorney so somebody can act for you in the event you can't act for yourself. And you wanna have a medical directive uh, so that in the worst case scenario, um, your wishes uh, are carried out. And if anyone needs convincing on that, reach out to me because I can give you a personal firsthand story about my own, uh, my own mother and, and why a medical directive matters. Uh, it will save your family if you have one and might cost you your family if you don't. Um, a living trust is a little bit of a different concept. Um, uh, living trusts are more popular in some of the Western states, I would say, than, than say a state like Pennsylvania. Um, there's, they're done here, but they're not as critical here. Probate is not as big a deal necessarily in Pennsylvania as it might be in say California. Um, it serves a little bit of a different purpose, but we are gonna be talking about trusts today and we're gonna talk about special needs trusts in particular, which are a special kind of trust. Just touch on this briefly, um, you should be aware of terms like guardianship and conservatorship and what do they mean. Essentially, guardianship is care of a person and conservatorship is care of stuff, money in particular. So you might have a bank trust company be a conservator, but you may not want the teller at the local bank to be the guardian of your child. No offense to all the tellers out there. Uh, or you might want great aunt Maud to be the guardian of your child, but great aunt Maud may not be able to balance her checkbook. So you may not want her to be the conservator of your assets. Those are two different roles. And, uh, and typically the, the person that's good at one isn't necessarily good at the other. It doesn't have to be one person. It can certainly be two or more. Common mistakes people make. They'll say, well, I'm not one of the Mellons. I'm not one of the Heinzes. Uh, I'm, you know, I've got two kids, little Johnny, little Susie. Uh, little Susie's got a special needs situation. I'll just leave everything to little Johnny because I know I can't leave anything to Susie. I'll just leave everything to little Johnny and he'll do the right thing when the time comes. Man, that's a heavy burden to lay on somebody that uh, little Susie may live to normal life expectancy, you know, into her 80s. And you're telling little Johnny, who's five, that for the next 80 years, he's going to take care of his sister. He may have in his heart to do that, but uh, many things can go wrong with that. Maybe little Johnny grows up and gets married and like more than half the people in the country gets divorced. And now his ex-wife has entitlement rights to the assets you intended for little Susie. Little Johnny grows up and has credit card problems. And now his creditors have entitlement rights to the assets you intended for little Susie. Or little Johnny gets in a car accident and a personal injury attorney um, is hired and wins a case against him. And now his client has entitlement rights to those assets. So disinheriting or disenfranchising your, your child is not a good solution. I highly don't recommend doing that. Um, and finding a well-intentioned family member might seem like an easy, simple solution, but it's got complexities that um, most folks aren't prepared to deal with. Is your well-intentioned family member who may have children of their own, if they get into a bind, what are they going to do? If they die without a will, their assets will go by the laws of intestacy to who the court says, not to who you intended. So, that's just bad planning. You know, you can just write this stuff down on a piece of paper and it'll happen the way you want it to. Uh, don't let it go by chance. In terms of dealing with your special needs child, there's one and only one way to make sure that their benefits are protected or their future possible benefits are protected. And that's by using something called a special needs trust. A special needs trust has particular language that says it's designed to supplement, not supplant Medicaid. What does that mean? It means the special needs trust can pay for everything Medicaid and SSI don't pay for and should not pay for anything they do pay for. In very simple terms, that's what that means. So an example I like to use is this. Uh, uh, Medicaid may provide your child who needs a wheelchair, a wheelchair, but it won't buy you a van with a lift so that you can take that wheelchair from point A to point B, but the special needs trust can pay for that. A special needs trust can pay for the family vacation to Disney World. Medicaid's not gonna pay for that. So your child doesn't have to live in a cave. 
your child can have the benefits of all the quality of life things that you'd want that child to have on into adulthood if they're done by way of a special needs trust. There are no dollar, dollar limits to the special needs trust. It can be as much or as little as you want it to be. Uh, there can be more than one. So for example, divorced parents, sadly it happens. Divorced parents may not want to commingle their assets. So, you know, mother may create a special needs trust for the child and father may create a separate special needs trust for the child and that's perfectly acceptable. It can be funded by anybody. It can be funded by the parents, by great aunt Maud, by grandma and grandpa, by siblings. Um, if, it's, if it's done as a third party trust, and I'll explain the difference between the different types of trusts here in a second, but if it's done by someone other than the person themselves, again, in my example, little Susie has a special needs situation. If that trust is funded by anybody except little Susie, it's considered a third party trust and Medicaid isn't paid back. So the assets that you leave in trust for the benefit of little Susie at her passing can go to other family members or anyone else you designate and won't go back to the government. Um, if they're funded by little Susie herself, that's called a first party trust or a D4A trust. And then in that case, in the case of a self-settled trust, Medicaid has the right to be paid back for any benefits it paid out, but the advantage is little Susie is immediately Medicaid qualified. So she gets all the advantages of Medicaid while having these other assets, which can be spent for quality of life issues in her lifetime. And if there's anything left in the trust, Medicaid first gets paid back and then any remainder can go to remaining family members. If there's nothing left in the trust because it all got spent on little Susie, well, Medicaid has no recourse against anybody. Um, so there, those are two of the three types of trusts, a third party trust, a first party trust, there's also something called a pooled trust, which a lot of charities will operate that, um, um, here locally in, in uh, the Pittsburgh area, um, uh, ARC of the United States, uh, the local ARC chapter uh, goes by Achieva and they've got something called the family trust. So the family trust operates what's called a pooled trust. So someone with fairly modest assets can put their money in the pooled trust. And again, the remainder of anything left in that either reverts to the charity or to Medicaid. Uh, because you're creating a trust, you do want to have a trustee and a trustee can be anybody. It can be an individual. Um, I generally would recommend using a trust company. Uh, there are trust companies that do this. You may have co-trustees, an individual and a trust company. You may have an individual acting as something called a trust protector. And their job primarily is to fire the trust company when the trust company doesn't do their job. But you want to have a trust company because frankly, I think if most people knew what the term trust trustee meant and the fiduciary liability that went with that, they wouldn't agree to be your trustee. It's a lot to take on. And there's a, there's a lot involved in terms of, you know, filings with Medicaid that most, frankly, most individuals aren't prepared to do their own tax returns let alone file Medicaid reports. So um, using a trustee in this case makes a lot of sense. Using a, a, a trustee that, de that deals in this arena makes a lot of sense. What can a special needs trust be used for? Any so-called qualified expense, anything that um, Medicaid doesn't currently pay for. It can pay for a personal care attendant, for vacations, for clothing, for, um, furnishings, out-of-pocket medical, medical expenses, if any. Uh, a fairly common one uh, we see are things like equine therapy for your child with autism, um, for uh, special programs, reading programs for your child with uh, Down syndrome, let's say, for uh, um, individualized education above and beyond the, uh, the confines of the school, for physical rehabilitation, uh, there's an asterisk next to purchase a home because there's some, again, SSI is really designed to pay for food, clothing, and shelter. So you have to be a little bit careful about uh, when, when you're crossing that line. The other thing I would say in terms of uh, the home is people say, I, I want little, little Johnny or little Susie to stay in our home. I want to put the home, our home in the trust. And you can do that, but I don't know about your home, but my home doesn't make me money. My home costs me money. 
I've got to pay utility bills. I've got to pay to have the grass cut. I've got to, you know, paint the walls, maintenance, upkeep. Um, you want the trust to generate some kind of income so it'll pay bills and it's okay to have a home in there, but you better have something else income producing in there as well. Um, it should not pay for food and shelter. The, the special needs trust should not pay for that. The government programs that provide for that should pay for that. What about an ABLE account? Um, there is such a thing in most states. The ABLE account is a way for an individual to have some assets that can be used for things slightly differently, uh, used slightly differently than a special needs trust. Um, there are limits to an ABLE account. There's a uh, one limitation is there can be only one per person. So mother and father can't each create an ABLE account for their special needs child. There is one ABLE account. There's a $15,000 contribution limit annually. Um, there's a fairly high threshold on how much can be accumulated in the trust, but there is a threshold, but uh, and it's different in every state. Um, in addition to that threshold, there's, a, so there's an SSI threshold that says, if you accumulate more than $100,000 in the ABLE account, you're no longer qualified for SSI. So there are some limitations you have to be aware of, but it has a it has a use. Uh, from our perspective, from my perspective, it's uh, it can be dovetailed with a special needs trust. It can be used for things like birthday gifts, or maybe your maybe your special needs child has a job and you've got to put the money in something uh, as opposed to a regular bank account, so that your child has walking around money without disqualifying themselves from government benefits. And that would be a way to use that. The ABLE account is built on the same chassis as a 529 plan, same kind of thing, you know, typically mutual funds, uh, you know, may be offered by the state or may be offered on a national level by a fund company like an American funds, for example, is a pretty common one. Um, but again, it's, uh, it, it, it can be used uh, to pay for some things that a special needs trust can't pay for, but it's got its limitations. Let's see. So we've talked about the different kinds of vehicles and uh, okay, fine, I get it. I need to have a special needs trust. Um, that's all well and good. Where's the money come from? How do I fund it? How much is, how much should I fund it for? Um, does it matter what I fund it with? Well, it can be funded with almost anything. <laughs> Jenny, if you have that. So it can come from almost anybody. So it can come from the individual's own earnings. But again, if it's self-funded, there are some Medicaid payback limits, right? It can otherwise come from parents, grandparents, siblings, almost anybody else. Um, it can be real property, um, rental properties. Um, it can be the home, again, subject to the, the idea that you know, if you're trying to generate income from this, you know, and the only asset in the trust is the home, the only way you're going to generate any income is to sell the home and you've just defeated your purpose. Uh, so there are some limits on using uh, the home in a vehicle like this. It could be investments. It could be investments outside of your 401k. You could make it the beneficiary of your 401k or otherwise subject to the, some tax issues. We'll talk about that in a second. It could be retirement funds of any kind. It could be life insurance and it could be any kind of life insurance. Um, uh, we'll talk about the various kinds here in a minute. The, the, the key is anywhere you'd want your special needs child to be named, either as a beneficiary of your will or the beneficiary of your investments or your 401k or IRA or otherwise, you would name the special needs trust for the benefit of that person as the beneficiary and thereby protect their benefits. We often see insurance used as a funding vehicle for this. Why? It kind of goes back to one of that very first question I asked is what happens when we're gone? Well, the advantage of using life insurance is it provides the benefit at exactly that moment, right? That it's when I'm gone that there's an issue. Well, when I'm gone is when life insurance pays off. So it's a fairly efficient vehicle. Don't have to use insurance, but it's an efficient vehicle for this purpose. 
If you fund a trust immediately, recognize that a special needs trust, a trust is a tax paying entity. It has its own tax table and it hits the top tax bracket at about $13,000 of income. So it doesn't take much uh, for a trust to get into the very top tax bracket, 39% or whatever the top bracket's gonna be under the next re regime. Um, so it can be expensive once it's funded if it's generating taxable income. If you're funding it with insurance, it's not funded until you pass. So your five-year-old child, you know, you may live 30 more years, that trust may not be funded for 30 years and therefore won't pay taxes that whole time because it's dry. It's got nothing in it except being named as a beneficiary of something down the road. Um, using insurance creates an instant estate. Typically it's income tax free. It's estate tax free. Typically for most people, it's inheritance tax free in, in Pennsylvania, um, free of probate. Um, uh, for someone at a very high, very high asset level, um, you can make it be a state tax free. For most individuals that I deal with, uh, it, it will be in fact federally a state tax free. And uh, it can be dialed up or down to fit almost any budget. So it's got flexibility that way. And it provides a death benefit at the time a death benefits called for. You know, what kind? Um, doesn't matter. You can use term insurance or permanent insurance, whole life, universal life, variable, universal life. Um, the only downside, the only downside of term is term insurance terminates. So, you know, if your child is five and you're using a 10 year level term policy, what are you going to use when they turn 16? Because you probably don't want to own a 10 year term policy in year 11. Does that mean it's not a good vehicle? No, it may be a part of the solution, but just be aware of its limitations. Permanent insurance is just that, it's permanent. It'll pay a death benefit when the time comes, but it's more expensive. So it has to fit your budget. So you have to weigh that. One type of insurance that most individuals typically aren't familiar with that, that, is, that fits this situation we find is something called survivorship insurance or second to die. Survivorship insurance was originally created as an estate tax planning tool, but it is uniquely fitted for a special needs situation, especially where there are two parents, because it's designed to pay a death benefit at the second death. Again, parents will say, oh, we'll take care of our child as long as we both draw breath. It's when we're gone that there's an issue, when we're both gone. Well, that's exactly when a survivorship policy pays off. And because it's not paying a benefit until the second death, it's typically much less expensive than that amount of insurance on two individuals separately. So it's cost effective. Um, how much is enough? That's tough. I mean, um, especially for a young child, you know, I don't know what your child's gonna need in the future. We, you know, there's some models we use to try to come up with a number, but I can tell you that the ARC of the United States published an article a couple of years ago that I often reference. And it said that in its studies, the average family spends between six and $16,000 a year out of pocket over and above any government benefits they receive. Well, if you've got a five-year-old who may live the normal life expectancy and you're spending $16,000 a year, you're going to need, you're going to need an amount of money of somewhere between a half a million and a million dollars, somewhere along the line to generate that $16,000 if you're not here to pay it. So it can be a big number. That doesn't mean it has to be an expensive solution. There are ways to do that cost effectively, but just realize that you know, if you, if you are the one paying for all these things for your child and you're not here, or you're the income engine that needs to be replaced, how much will it take to replace that income engine? That's where a financial advisor like an Alex can help you kind of work through that to come up with a number that makes sense. So again, that's a lot to take on. We talked about the different kinds of vehicles to have, the legal documents that you want to have in place, the kind of financial vehicles you want to have in place. It's really important that you get the right kind of financial team on your side, a trust company um, that you trust that's going to do what needs to be done, an attorney who understands the, these kinds of documents, a financial advisor who understands um, what's involved. And it's not all of them. I just had this conversation yesterday with an attorney that I know locally 
who referred a client to me, they, their big time stockbroker guy, big national firm whose name I won't mention, advised their client that he could set up a program to spend away that special needs person's assets over the next five years to get them Medicaid qualified. Well, that'll work. <laughs> you can spend all your money. That's not a good solution. That person, that advisor doesn't understand special needs planning. Uh, th that's the wrong guy or wrong gal. Um, you need to find people that work in this arena and they're out there. The Academy of Special Needs Planners, the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, uh, there are different organizations like that. Reach out to your local uh, United Cerebral Palsy or Down Syndrome uh, Association, um, uh, National Down Syndrome Society, um, um, uh, uh, ARC, um, those kinds of organizations can point you in the right direction. Um, and other advisors, um, organizations like the ones I mentioned can point you in the direction of somebody in your area. One last document that we'll talk about, it's not strictly speaking a legal document, but it's important. It's called a letter of intent or a memorandum of intent. It's basically a note to the babysitter as if you're going to the movies and never coming home. Who else knows that your child won't take their meds unless they're wearing their favorite red sweater? Who else knows that there are certain pediatricians you want your child to go to and certain pediatricians you never want your child to go to? Who else knows that you know, they, um, there are certain kinds of cereal that your child likes uh, and others that they just won't eat under any circumstances? Probably nobody knows that the way you do. You can write this stuff down. We provide an outline. Our firm provides an outline to clients. And most of the bigger organizations like UCP and ARC um, and the Down Syndrome Society um, have one as well. It's just that, an outline. It can be at one page. It can be 60 pages in as much detail as you'd like. And it's really a living document because your child at five's needs are going to be different than your child at 15 or 25 or 35. And so it's something that needs to be updated as you go along. And it can be a way for a parent to kind of express in words exactly how a caregiver should care for your child when you're not here. Again, um, lots, of, lots of questions come out of this that uh, can only be properly answered with good, sound, financial, legal uh, planning and advice um, to the extent that we can offer that up or point you in the right direction. We're happy to do that. But it's not, it's not important that you deal with me. It's really important that you deal with somebody like me that at least understands the terms and understands the issues um, and can steer you in the right direction. Um, this is how we work with clients. I typically, uh, and, and many advisors do it this way. Everyone's a little different, but we typically do an initial interview uh, at no cost, get a grip on what's needed and take it from there and then refer in the other professionals that are, that are required. Um, other folks may do it differently, but that's how we do it. And we do these, I do these workshops for lots of different organizations. I'm happy to do them for your organization. Again, uh, I've made a commitment to provide the information. There's no cost or obligation to anybody. When I do these, the object is to get the uh, information out there. I'm always stunned by, I've been doing these workshops since 2004 for groups uh, large and small and not once not ever in that whole time amongst the hundreds of people that I've talked to has anyone come up to me and said you know Bob I knew all this already I haven't learned a thing that has just never happened so to the extent we can get the word out to people as to what they need to do and uh, and what these different thresholds are like what happens at 18 your child's an adult at 18 they have privacy rights that you need to understand that, right? That your child walks into a hospital at the age of 19 bleeding from the ears. The hospital is not even supposed to tell you that they've been admitted. They have privacy rights, just like you do. So you need to be aware of some of those things. To the extent we can help you, my contact information is there. Certainly Alex, um, um, I'm sure would be more than happy to help you in any way you can. And with that, um, I'd be glad to take any questions that might've come up. Alex, you're on mute, but I know that we have a list of questions to go through and yeah. we may not uh, be able to get to them all. 
once again, uh, if you can leave your question with your phone number, we can go ahead and give you a call and get back to you as well. Okay, go ahead, Alex. Okay, first question, Bob. Bob, could you repeat the uh, name of the National Organization for Special Needs Planners and Attorneys? Are you there? Uh, the Academy of Special Needs Planners. This is the one I referenced. The Academy of Special okay. Needs Planners. If you... Uh, you Google that website, you tell them what state you're in, they'll point you in the direction of, of uh, uh, an attorney or a financial advisor in your area, or at least in your state. Okay. Um, does the special needs trust uh, help allay the concerns of the $2,000 limit? It absolutely does because it's not a countable resource. So the assets in the special needs trust are not a countable resource. Um, so it, it does exactly that. That's exactly what right. it's designed to do. Right, that's its intended purpose. So um, is the money in an ABLE account taxed when you take any of it out? The money in an ABLE account. Um, so is it taxed when you take out? Remember you, you had assimilated it to a 529, which you know one of the benefits of a 529 is it's supposed to come out tax free. If, if used to pay for education, um, that's that's correct. And to be honest, uh, I need to I need to check that because I'm not absolutely certain if um, if you get that benefit tax free. I I thought that any withdrawals were in fact taxable, but I'll confirm that and I can circle back to you, Alex, with that information if somebody wants to check back with you. Okay. I, I just don't want to misstate that because uh, I, I don't want to mislead anybody. Right. We'll get you that answer. Okay. Um, we've got a, one of our members here is looking for a special needs financial advisor to convert a 529C account into an ABLE account in the Dallas, Texas area. The 529C was created in California by a grandparent. I'm sorry, the question is you want to know what the mechanics are to convert a 529 to an ABLE account? Yeah, and I guess the, the account, they want to create it, they want to convert a 529C account to an ABLE account. It's, and they're in the Dallas, Texas area now, but the 529C was originally created in California by a grandparent. Right. Well, that's a fairly specific question. I want to be a little bit careful about giving specific tax advice, but uh, num number one, I, to answer the original question, I think the ABLE account earnings aren't taxable, but if you take money out of the um, 529, it would be my understanding that it would be taxable coming out of the 529 and then could be, you know, the, the net proceeds can be donated to the uh, ABLE account. I don't think you can do that kind of a conversion and avoid taxation, but again, I'd have to confirm that. Right. So it's not like a rollover to an IRA. So I don't believe, I don't believe that's the case. Right. Um, can an ABLE account be funded by special needs trust through uh, any directives? I'm not sure why you would want to. I'm not sure why you would want to do that because remember the remainder in an ABLE account um, is going to revert to Medicaid. The remainder in a special needs trust is not typically if it's third party, right? I would right. use an ABLE account differently. I would use the ABLE account to, as a repository for any earnings of the special needs child, possibly any gifts, um, Christmas, birthday, you know, holiday gifts, that kind of thing. Um, right. Um, money, uh, if they're working, as you said, if they're working, they could put their money back to the ABLE account you had mentioned. That'd be one way, that'd be one. There are a couple of different vehicles. Uh, you, you know, typically, People will say, well, I, my, I don't want my child to work because if they work, they'll have income and they'll, they'll be disqualified. Well, there are ways to uh, generate offsetting expenses, right? So, for example, uh, your child's living at home, they have a job, maybe you, char you charge your child rent. That's a legitimate expense. If they had an apartment, they'd pay rent. Um, as long as they're using the proceeds to pay a legitimate rent, that's what would be one way to shelter that. Um, so... There are some things you can do, great some really simple tools you can use that way to, again, allow them to do, to live their lives the way you want them to live their lives. 
Uh, we have one here. We have a, a we have a special needs sibling, and the last parent had died uh, last May. The trust hasn't paid any benefits yet. Um, there are several siblings in the will states. All siblings share equally in the estate. Can a special needs trust still be established now after the death of the parent? All the uh, all the siblings are adults, 50 plus, and the special needs person is 62. Well, that's that's a legal question, and in keeping with my standing agreement to not practice law without a license, I don't think I'm really the right person to ask that question of. But it seems to me that at your past, well, once you've passed, somebody else can't change the terms of your will, is what I would presume. But I would just, I would refer that question to a lawyer and to a lawyer in your state. Okay. I think that ends all the questions. Actually, Alex, I'm oh, here's, pass we got, you we a, got couple a couple more. more here. I see him down here. Okay. Um, if this, is, I'm not sure what this one it came from. It says medical power of attorney at age 18. It doesn't really state as a question though, so to speak. Maybe you can talk about um, what is the power of attorney and right. how does that affect medical decisions after they turn 18? Right. So the idea would be if if a person is, number one, a person has to have, they don't like to use the word competent anymore because it sounds like a pejorative, but they've got to have the mental capacity to be able to make a decision. If a person who's a, a minor can't do a power of attorney because a minor doesn't have standing to do that, right? So you'd have to be of majority. So you'd have to be 18 or older. Or older. Right. Number two, they'd have to have the mental capacity to be able to sign a legal document, right? So someone who's mentally incapacitated can't do, I would say, again, this is a legal question, but it seems to me, from my understanding, that uh, someone who doesn't have legal standing can't do, um, can't sign that kind of a document. But if they otherwise have the mental capacity to be able to sign a legal document, then, um, and they're 18, then they could, in fact, sign a um, um, power of attorney, and the idea of doing the power of attorney would be, give, would be to give somebody else the ability to act for you in the event you can't act. Okay. Well, there was a comment from the original commenter saying that uh, they were just suggesting a medical power of attorney has helped them a lot in their situation. Okay. Um, um, yeah, um, um, it, it would, because again, if you can't function for yourself, you know, if you can't function for yourself and someone needs to act for you, there are some things that, like a qualified account, an IRA, you can't get to without that, right? Without having the, that authority, so. Uh, what are the questions that uh, should be asked of an attorney to know that they understand special needs? Um, you might ask, how how long have you been involved in working with families with special needs trusts? Um, when, how many such documents or, or clients did you work on in the last 12 months? What organizations locally are you involved with? Um, is there a PowerPoint available? Um, I'm Marcia, I said, I know there's gonna be a YouTube that can be replayed. I don't know about the PowerPoint. So we don't share the slides, but we will um, share a replay. So look for your email uh, in the next couple of days. We will be sending out a replay. And then once, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. Uh, once we have it go through uh, some other hoops on our end, we will be hosting it on our YouTube channel. Uh, Alex, I did pass a couple more questions before we let Bob go. And I know there'll be more coming in once again. Uh, we will reach out to you if you leave your phone number. Go ahead, Alex. Okay, uh, is guardianship the same for persons over the age of 18? I'm, I'm sorry, say that again. I'm not sure I followed the question. Is guardianship, says, is guardianship the same for persons over the age of 18? I know you talked about guardianship being the care of a person and when they're a minor child, of course, that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's presumed that a parent is a guardian for a minor child. 
um, you can have guardianship for a person over the age of 18. Well, here's the, here's the tricky part of that. Um, as I, again, as I understand it, this is kind of a legal question as well, but in order to be named somebody's guardian, they, you have to take away their rights as an adult, right? So someone who doesn't have the mental capacity to act for themselves, that may, you may have no choice, right? That they just, they have to have someone do these things for them because they can't do for themselves. But when you do that, in effect, you're having your child declared to be a child forever till court deems otherwise. So it's a, it's a pretty serious move. It's definitely, uh, it, it's something you wanna think through. Or do you really want to take away your child's right to be an adult forever? Um, you may not have a choice. Um, for a lot of parents, you know, they've got children kind of in between. They're fairly high functioning and they don't wanna take away their ability to act for themselves or someday in the future act for themselves. So it's, it's, it's not something to, to be done lightly, but it is a conversation to have with your attorney. Okay. Um, we set up a special needs trust when my son was diagnosed with the condition. Uh, we began to fund it and then we were told it wasn't to be funded until both myself and my husband passed away. Uh, so they defunded it. We had set up an ABLE account, but could only put in 15000 because that's the uh, maximum allowable contribution. My son is over 18. He's receiving SSI. Um, they had told SSI that he had a special needs trust. They wanted to know the amount in the trust. I thought the special needs trust didn't affect his SSI. If the trust was funded with assets not in the hands of the special needs person, then SSI should have no reference to that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, I would say, I would say, you know, they need to engage someone to help them with that, either from a local organization like um, ARC, UCP, otherwise, um, um, or an attorney. If it was done, if it was designed properly, then SSI should have no reference to that. Okay. Um, do I need to have a special needs trust if I have an ABLE account? Well, I, 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 think I've, I think I've responded to that. In my opinion, I, if, if your assets are really, really fairly limited, Enable account may be sufficient, but if they're if they're of any consequence at all, um, enable account is not going to be sufficient. And if you've got other children, other you know, the, your special needs child has siblings that you may want to uh, receive any remainder in the account, then then a special needs trust is a better solution. I would not view an ABLE account as a substitute for a uh, special needs trust. I would view it as a complement to it. Okay, if I relocate, uh, does that impact my special needs estate plan? Uh, it impacts it this way. It, sh it shouldn't affect, it should not affect um, Medicaid eligibility. Uh, if it's been funded, it, um, if it's been funded, it could affect the tax cost of administering the trust based on the state you're in. Um, in terms of the legal operation of it, it should not, it would seem to me. Again, that's kind of a legal question, but I, uh, you don't have to rewrite the trust just because you move from state to state. Um, a lot of this planning assumes that the child won't be able to support themselves financially, but what if the child might be able to have a job and support themselves? Um, again, the answer is it depends. Um, that's always the answer, right? It depends because when you say support themselves, are they going to get um, full-time employment? Um, it may the worst case scenario is you create a special needs trust and because they've got other assets, they don't 
immediately qualify for Medicaid? Will that always be true? Will they always have a job? Will they always be able to support themselves? I mean, the worst, it seems to me, the worst that happens in that situation is you spent some money on legal fees to create a document that you may not, that your child may not need, at least may not need right away, but may need in the future. Um, it, it doesn't hurt you to have it. It may hurt you not to have it, if not now, sometime in the future, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then I think we kind of hit on this one before, but it says, well, special needs trust affect the amount that a person receives in SSI. And I think you had said before that it should not impact that. Not as long as it's not the assets of the child. Well, it shouldn't affect them, period. If it's a properly designed special needs trust, um, no matter who it's funded by, they should be SSI eligible immediately. Okay, Folks, I think that's everything. I believe that's all the time we have for questions. And I, well, I might, to... let me just answer one thing because I oh, really yes, go ahead. dug this up. Uh, you can convert Enable to a 529 and avoid the 10% penalty on mm -hmm. the 529 for because you didn't spend it on college. But I believe the pro, I believe any income would still be taxable. It wouldn't be subject to the penalty, but it would be taxable. Well, thank you, Bob. I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone else except for me. And I want to uh, I want to thank our speaker today and the organizations that worked with us to make bring you this webinar. Thank you so much for attending. Look for an email soon with a link to the replay of this event, and you're welcome to share that replay with your friends and your family. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping people find a financial advisor who is a great fit for, for your life and your financial questions. Our matching service is free to you. And every one of our advisor partners has committed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Once again, from Advice Chaser, thank you so much for coming. And we will see you at another webinar soon. Goodbye, everyone.